Hello, everybody. As you're filling out your forms, I'm Melinda Dickin. I am. Uh, I teach in the undergraduate department here on the Azusa campus, and I'm transitioning into the uh, chair role of the undergraduate department as well. So I'm wearing a lot of hats, and I'm still chairing the admissions committee for undergraduates. So I get to read everybody's uh, philosophies of nursing. So I am going to be talking about how do we address challenging student issues. But before I talk about that, I want you to answer, what is the essence of your role as a faculty member in the School of Nursing, whether it be didactic, clinical, or both? So just shout out a word or two that comes to your mind. Mentor. Mentor. Nourish. Nourish. Encourage. Encourage. Counsel. Counsel. Role model. Role model. Challenge. Challenge. Be loved. Interesting how I didn't hear anything that said, if they do not use the right IV catheter size, if they forget to check the armband, while all of these things are important, our role goes so far beyond the skills. Yes, we need to teach them the psychomotor skills or the didactic content for them to be competent and safe nurses. Absolutely. But what do you do when the student is just not navigating the course or their curriculum um, in a way that they should, whether it be personal challenges, emotional ones, physical challenges, uh, health-related issues, um, whether they just are not accessing tutoring, all of these things come to our uh, knowledge as faculty members as we engage with them. So what do you do? So the first thing I want to show you is, you know, it always starts with the conversations. And isn't it the conversations right before class? Hey, do you have a minute? And then 45 minutes later, you have been revealed so much that's going on with the students. What do you do? So it always starts with the, with the conversation. So what do you, you student, what are you doing to help that situation? Have you accessed tutoring for this particular, particular class? Have you accessed the Learning Enrichment Center? Um, so are you accessing the different resources? But how do you know what those resources are? And in some of the presentations, we've got the Office of Campus um, Pastors. We've got the Counseling Center. We have the Health Center. The Office of Student Life is a good go-to place to refer students that are having issues. But if you can't remember all that, then do this. Uh, we have something called the APU CARES team in the, in the, school, in the uh, school. So if you can't remember all that, I've, I've already sent this link to Lori Salau. But through our website, I just, I just uh, entered um, CARE team. And this is what comes up. It tells you a little bit about our care team. But if you really have a student that you perceive uh, is in crisis, whether it be um, physical, emotional, you do have to log on. So let me set this down for a second. So you log in through your APU username. Mine is M. Dickin, and then you put in your password. And then you can online submit this CARES form. So I had a conversation just this last week uh, with one of our faculty who uh, brought to my attention a student issue, and, and she's like, this is what I've done, and do you have any recommendations? I said, based on what you're describe, describing, they need an immediate referral to our care team. So sent her the link and, um, and filled out the form. What that does is send, um, uh, provides an opportunity for the student to access multiple resources. So there will be a follow-up person that then contacts that student and says, okay, do you need to see the campus pastor? Do you need to go to the counseling center? Do you need a health center? Et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of the umbrella of helping our students access resources. Now, you can certainly ask the student, you know, may I refer you to the care team? But if it's truly an urgent issue, um, you can refer them, uh, and, then, and then they can, they can follow up. I've done both, Grace. So this is just through the general APU website um, online. So that tells me that all um, APU faculty would have access to it through their username. But, uh, but, but again, there is language in there if you needed to specify 
uh, where the student is. So the, the, the more you know about the situation, um, the better. So the reason for the referral, their, their first and last name, on and on. So you have a lot of options and then a section for comments, okay? So you definitely want to include um, any other faculty or administrator, your chair, um, that should be part of the conversation as well. So if you are a clinical instructor, and you would obviously need to talk to the lead faculty about that and include the chair, okay? And then it gives you the option, I've communicated the student, no, but I have attempted to notify the student. So there have been situations where um, a student is MIA in clinical. That's not good. And when we don't hear from them. And so after three days of this, I said, find the student. Somebody find the student. So that is there for a resource. Any questions about this? So again, that'll be available on your Sakai. Yes. Excellent question. So if there is a student that you truly feel like is a danger to themselves and others, you you need to notify campus safety immediately and or call 911 if necessary. And I have, um, I have had to get campus safety come in immediately when I felt the student um, was potentially in a serious situation and have them escorted to the health center and then ultimately 911, okay? Yes, Grace. And, and ultimately, you know, you are not responsible to truly evaluate, oh gosh, is this a crisis or not? You know, when in doubt, of course you guys know to call 911, of course. Okay, so now um, I want to move to um, what do you do with the student, and I'm going to talk a little bit about clinical here, that is just not moving with the rest of the clinical group. Of course, it always starts with the conversation, right? Student, what do you think the issue is? You know, how do you think that this can be improved? You know, have that verbal conversation. Okay? Uh, student, we, st we spoke about this three days ago, so this, this is an issue, having that conversation. But if that verbal, once you've done that verbal, if that doesn't, if that doesn't work, um, sometimes it requires a written warning. And I'm not going to poll who's done a written warning. Um, so anything that a, a, a faculty person thinks is serious enough, you don't have to start with a verbal warning. Office, oftentimes it does. But if you, you think it's serious enough, it can go right to a written warning. So for example, I had one student one time, and despite talking about patient safety in terms of um, um, having the bed in the lowest position and the rails down, the student was bathing the patient and forgot some washcloths, and so uh, hightailed it out of the room real quick and left the bed in the highest position and all the rails down. Of course that required an immediate written warning. And the student, we had a conversation and it included what was the deficiency um, and then uh, what is the plan for improvement and an opportunity for the student in, to engage in the conversation, respond, sign the written warning, it went in their file, and I, and I reemphasize it's not a red, red flag on your file for the rest of your life, it's an opportunity for improvement. And ultimately the student came back, I'm really so glad we took that seriously. It was painful at the time, but now I will never make that, that mistake again. So when you're not sure kind of what would warrant uh, a warning, et cetera, by all means, if you do have to go to a written warning, cite the language in your handbook. This is uh, on your Sakai adjunct site available to you. And like I said, many warnings may start with verbal, but they don't have to, okay? So that is in there. Um, but what, what types of things would require some sort of warning? Ethical practices, violation, uh, patient abandonment, lack of preparation. Now, um, lack of preparation, uh, this is a matter of uh, assessing it based on the situation. If a student is not maybe prepared to give meds that particular day, maybe you're not going to let them pass meds. So you're kind of looking for patterns there. What is the issue? The bottom line is, you know, as evaluators in the clinical setting, obviously we're not going to wait till, you know, the last day of clinical for, to, to inform the patient whether or not they pass. That's not what it's about. We want them to be successful. So it's, it's uh, not only identifying, but documenting your plan of correction throughout the semester, giving the students an opportunity <laughs> to improve. And then if after the written warning, if there was not an improvement, then we would be talking about clinical probation, where then now the student cannot pass the course until they have fulfilled um, these areas under their plan for improvement. Does that make sense? 
Okay? So if a student ultimately fails, and remember, we don't fail them. They have not, if, if the student fails, they have not met the objectives for the course. That's ultimately what fails a student, right? But what, what our responsibility is that we've identified it, we have the conversation, whether it be verbal or in writing, and we provided a plan of correction that the student is on notice. That's why I highly recommend, regardless of if you've done a written warning, even if you've had a verbal conversation, email the student through Sakai and say, hey, as a follow-up to what we discussed today in clinical, you're going to do A, B, C, and D. And that way, in your course shell, you have documentation that the student was on notice of that. If you are in the habit of emailing students through your personal Yahoo account, um, it could be problematic. So that's just another recommendation that I have in that regard. Okay, so I'm going to quickly just highlight some areas in the handbook um, I want you to be aware are in there. So that one is for the clinical uh, probations. And then let's see. So criteria for warning, um, again, um, and, and again, don't, don't wait till the very end. You could, at, at midterm, if there's an issue, it has got to be corrected. And please, if you're a clinical instructor and there's a lead for the course, any issue with the student, the lead faculty needs to be in the loop. Uh, CC'd on those emails with, to the student. Absolutely, bring in the lead faculty on the conversations and the chair as needed of, of the department, okay? All right, let me skip down to page 30. I'll skip that part. Um, I'm just gonna point out, you have an entire uh, bloodborne pathogens Sakai site, you have to do that every year. But Lori, I'm thinking it may be useful um, on the adjunct to have the bloodborne pathogens exposure form on, on, their, on their site. Because if there is an exposure, there's an actual uh, process. There's a form that has to be filled out, it has to go to our HR department, and it has, to be, it has to be documented. So there's a whole process of that. Bring your lead faculty so that they can refer you um, appropriately. Okay, and then the other thing, where's this one? Um, health, health policies and technical standards. When students are in clinical, they must fulfill health policies and technical standards. So of course, the immunizations, TB testing, CPR, blood borne pathogens, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you know, all know about that. They can't go to clinical without compliance to that. But what about the student that subsequent to starting their clinical courses has an issue? Um, you know, they sprang an ankle or something like that. These are our technical standards that they must be able to fulfill in order to participate in clinical. Um, so I'm not going to read all of these, but these, these were cleared upon their admission. Right. So what if, what if things change uh, uh, during their clinical? This is, this is what I wanted to highlight. You as the instructor, if you think that there is something that is hindering the student from being able to fully participate in clinical, you can require them to uh, get a medical release. So if a student misses a clinical on Tuesday because they have a fever, they need to have documentation before they can resume clinical the next time. They can't just say, oh, I feel better. Well, I'm really happy for you, but show me the evidence, okay? I had a student once that, um, beginning of the semester, um, in my foundations class, came in and said, so I'm feeling really great, but by the way, I have a chronic back issue and the doctor says I can't lift more than 10 pounds. Um, okay, that's a problem in lab, because so you can't do transfers in two days in lab, period, end of story. So within two days, she had an orthopedic clearance that she had been upgraded um, on her uh, weight restrictions. Okay, so it, it, um, when in terms of like modified duty, it becomes challenging. Can they participate in clinical? So, you know, even if there's times where, okay, you might have them do an alternate assignment, um, you can evaluate, but they need to be able to participate in clinical. So if there's an issue, whether it be emotional or physical, that you feel can impact their ability to perform safe care, you can require an assessment. And again, bring in your lead fa faculty and or your chair um, in that situation. Um, it's a, we, we wanna protect the student, we wanna protect you, and we wanna protect the school in terms of liability related issues, okay? So very, very important. Questions on this one? Um, I can say a quick note about that. Um, 
How many of you have asked a student to write a letter of recommendation? Quite a few. There is a form in the School of Nursing that they are supposed to fill out uh, requesting uh, who it's for, what it's for, and then on the back of that form is a actual release for you to um, send the recommendation. If a student emails, me, emails you and says, will you write one, you need to say, you need to fill out the letter of recommendation. Please see your program manager. So for our undergraduate, it would be Cherise. For Monrovia campus, maybe um, somebody else. They need to actually do that form. And so, uh, and you really can't just, it needs to be specific to, you know, uh, an employer or something. It can't just be to, you know, their Aunt Bessie or whatever, you know, so, yeah. So that's the distinction. If it's a current student, you need the request form so that you can write it and submit it on APU letterhead. So if it's after graduation, it would be on your own. Did you have a comment? Exactly. So the student has given permission to release that information. OK? Yeah. Yes? OK, so I kind of highlighted um, you know, what do we do if a student is struggling uh, emotionally or in class, how to refer them to um, the resources at the university, how you manage in, in clinical. Uh, but ultimately, you know, d don't feel like you have to just make these decisions independently. Bring your lead faculty and or your chair uh, into the conversation. Because we not only care about them becoming safe nurses, we care about their well-being. And I saw a hand over here somewhere. Right. And so her, she's saying again, if it's from a sp specific facility like Cedars, uh, the student then would have to, you know, make sure that they have released for, for you to do that information. And as a courtesy, the student really should give you a heads up and say, you are going to be receiving an email from, you know, when you get it after the fact, you know, you get it from Cedar, and I'm like, I have no idea about this. I wait for the student to give me a heads up, okay? Well, in, in that particular case, when they have authorized that agency to release that, information to, to get to you. We've had students uh, coming back, you know, a couple months later or whatever, um, and they want us to send to eight people, uh, to or eight agencies, but they don't give us any names. We're not going to do that. It's a name for a, uh, for a um, report uh, or a letter rec. You can do 10 of the same, but you need to know who the letter you're writing is going to, and there needs to be a name on that. That's to protect you and to protect the student. Any last questions on student-related challenges? Okay, is that helpful? Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, Melinda. Um, we're gonna, I think, take a few minutes break, and then Renee is gonna come in and give us the Dean's update. Uh, I just wanted to say one thing. When we think of all the work we're doing, we have brought these students into the School of Nursing. We've vetted them, we've said we want you, and we've said we want you to be successful. And we have an obligation, I believe, to do everything in, that we can do as faculty to give them the best education that we can and to be with them in that process of growth and development and licensure or master's degree. Our goal is to keep our students here and to do well. And so everything that we do um, needs to be focused around our desire for our students to be successful. And then ultimately, our desire is that we provide excellent patient care to the glory of God. And I think you guys are all those people that want to make that happen. So take a break. Oh.